America has so many untold stories buried in history. About a year ago, I heard one of them from my friend Joe, who is a history teacher. And that story led me on a journey to the most rewarding and challenging project of my career. It transformed my life, and it changed my relationship with my son. It was a story of the worst incidents of racial violence in this country, the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. Picture this. It is May 31st, 1921. Tulsa is the oil capital of the world. Train tax runs smack down the middle of the city. On one side are gleaming new office buildings, hotels, an opera house, all built by newly rich oil men and developers, all white. On the other side of the tracks, just steps away, is Greenwood. Greenwood is an all-black district of about 11,000 people. It is incredibly entrepreneurial and affluent. There are hundreds of businesses here, a hospital, banks, a library, two newspapers, 20 churches. It is so successful that Booker T. Washington nicknames its business district Black Wall Street. In less than 24 hours, it will all be gone. Thousands of white Tulsans will burn it to the ground and murder at least 300 residents. When I heard this story, I was stunned. I minored in American history, and I am a journalist, and I had never heard of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. So I did what any journalist would do. I flew to Tulsa, and I asked questions of the keepers of this story. And then I spent six weeks day and night writing a podcast series about it. Metaphorically, I lived in 1921, getting to know the heroes and the villains. I fell in love with so many of the characters, like B.C. Franklin, an attorney who fought for civil rights, and Lula Williams, the woman who built a 750-seat movie theater, the Dreamland Theater and Bernice Sims. On May 31st, 1921, she is about to get her dream come true. She has been waiting for months for the high school prom. And she is about to get her new, beautiful, blue satin evening dress on and a strand of pearls. And she is imagining dancing in the arms of her boyfriend. But Bernice Sims never makes it to the prom. Instead, she and her family flee Tulsa for their lives. Let me take you back a day and tell you what happened so that you can understand. It is May 30th, Memorial Day, middle of the afternoon. A 19-year-old man named Dick Rowland is in the downtown, uh, downtown Tulsa office building, and he is about to step onto an elevator run by Sarah Page who is white and 17, but he trips, and he steps on her foot. He touches her arm. She screams, and somewhere else in the building, a clerk hears her scream, and without seeing anything, he picks up the phone, and he calls the police, and he says, Dick Rowland just assaulted Sarah Page. The word assault in 1921 Tulsa means rape. Within a few hours, the headline on the white newspaper reads, Negro to be lynched in Tulsa tonight. The sheriff takes Dick Rowland into protective custody and puts him on the top floor of the courthouse. Down below the courthouse, in the courthouse square, by nightfall, an angry white mob is gathering, getting bigger and bigger. And some members of that mob, they have weapons in one hand and alcohol in the other. 
The police commissioner, fearing that he does not have enough police officers, makes a decision that will change the course of history, and he deputizes 500 members of this mob on the spot. On the other side of the train tracks, there's a small group of World War I veterans who decide no one will be lynched in Tulsa tonight. They fought overseas for freedom and dignity and respect, and they expect it here. And so they cross those train tracks, and they go to the courthouse, and they offer their assistance to the sheriff. But there's an altercation, and a gun goes off, and someone is killed, and all hell breaks loose. By the next morning, thousands of Tulsans from the white side of Tulsa invade Greenwood and they shoot anyone they see, man, woman, and child. And I am sorry to say that some of the people doing the shooting were children. They have rifles and they have guns and they have planes dropping flaming balls of turpentine from the air. It is 20 years before World War II, and this is the first time American citizens are bombed from the air. They drop bodies in the Arkansas River, and they bury them in mass graves. Houses and buildings are looted. 1,200 buildings are burnt to the ground. After 16 hours, the Oklahoma National Guard finally arrives and they stop this madness. But then they round up every last remaining resident of Greenwood and they march them to an internment camp set up at the fairgrounds. The only way out is if a white employer comes to get you. And after you do get out, you are forced to wear a little green tag that says who you are, where you live, and where you work. <sighs> no one was ever prosecuted for this crime, and not a single Greenwood resident ever received a dollar of insurance money. Thousands of people never returned. This story shook me. It shook my world because it would shake anyone's world. But it particularly shook me because my teenage son, who I adopted at six weeks old, is black. And after I learned this story, I realized that while I had thought I had understood his experience in the world, I hadn't, not at all. I hadn't believed him when, at 11 years old, he came to me and he said, Mama, teacher said something racist. And I didn't totally understand what was happening when a police officer in the neighborhood asked him where he lived, but not his white friends. I wasn't naive. I told him not to bicycle through the alleys to get home at dusk, even though his white friends could. These racist incidents that my son was suffering are born from the same kinds of beliefs and dynamics and rhetoric that made Tulsa possible. After I learned about Tulsa, I had the privilege of apologizing to my son. I had understood intellectually what he was facing, but I still have a lot to learn. This history helped me understand it in my heart. After I apologized to him, I asked him, what would you want all of you to know? And he said, I want them all to know how scared I am to live in the world every single day. And then I said, why does it matter if I understand this 100-year-old history? And he said, because now I finally feel heard. Exposing the secrets of our shared history can change the world and it can change our relationships with each other. But secrets die hard. 
The Tulsa Race Massacre was hardly mentioned again for decades because white Tulsans had everything to hide and survivors of Greenwood were traumatized. Even today, 99 years later, it is barely taught in Tulsa schools. It is not mandatory across the state of Oklahoma, never mind the rest of the country. And Tulsa was not an isolated incident. There were hundreds like it, called race riots, never correctly reported as massacres, and buried in history, just like Tulsa. Now, you may be wondering, what happened to Dick Rowland, the man who tripped in the elevator? The sheriff spirited him out of town the morning of the invasion, and he was never heard from again. And what about Venice Sims, who didn't make it to her prom? Well, in the year 2000, a group of students at Booker T. Washington High, which by now was half white and half black, heard what happened on the night of May 31st, and they did something remarkable. They invited her to their prom, and she said yes. And she put on a beautiful blue evening gown and a strand of pearls, and at 95 years old, she finally went to the prom where she looked around at this sea of black and white faces in all their finery dancing together. And she said, these students represent my hope for Tulsa. They are connected to the city's past. They honor its heritage. And they are committed to social change. So how can we all expose the secrets of our shared history? If you are a creator, find and tell these stories in whatever medium is yours to use. Write the books, make the films, produce the podcast, paint the pictures, because when we lose these stories, yes, we lose the tragedies, but we lose the triumphs of the human spirit. In Greenwood, that meant beginning to rebuild. In Tulsa today, 99 years later, it means finally convincing the city to search for those mass graves, not as a scholarly exercise, but as a criminal investigation. There is power in sharing the truth of our secrets in history. And we can all play a role the next time you hear a story about America's past, ask these three questions. Who is telling it? Who benefits? And who is missing? Thank you.